This presentation was originally given at the Sibyl Kairos UK annual conference this year. It's entitled The Biblical Response to Israeli Apartheid. And we're going to be answering three essential questions. First of all, what does the Bible say about apartheid? How has apartheid been justified? And how can apartheid be refuted from the Bible? But before we look at what the Bible says, let's begin with uh, something of a context and definition. In 1963, Martin Luther King co-led the famous Civil Rights March uh, in Washington, D.C. against racism and segregation. In what's become probably the most well-known and widely quoted speech in history, King shared a dream, his dream of a diverse but united multi-ethnic uh, nation. He said, I've ha I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their character. And he concluded, when we let freedom ring, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. As John Stott says, we are still waiting for the fulfillment of his dream. Yet it is a Christian dream. God has given us in scripture a vision of the redeemed as, quote, a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne. That's Revelation 7. That dream we know will come true. Meanwhile, inspired by it, we should seek at least an approximation of it on earth. Namely, a society characterized by justice, no discrimination, harmony, no conflict for all ethnic groups. We are looking for a fully integrated society which continues to celebrate diversity. Well, the origins of contemporary institutional racism can be traced back to the European colonization of the Americas and Africa, and in particular, to the slave trade. But with the abolition of uh, slavery, institutional racism evolved into American segregation, German anti-Semitism, and South African apartheid. And this led also to what is now recognized as apartheid in Israel, Palestine. John Stott observes, anti-Semitism in Germany and apartheid in South Africa seem at first sight so different from one another. Nevertheless, the theory of race on which both systems were built is almost identical. So is the sense which many Germans and South Africans have expressed that they are destined to rule and must at all costs preserve their racial purity. Now, that word apartheid in South African is derived from the root apart, meaning separate, and hide, meaning hood. So it's translated aparthood. And it describes a system of institutional racial segregation that existed in South Africa and Southwest Africa, now Namibia, from 1948 until the early 1990s. But it was being practiced uh, at least a century earlier. The 1998 Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court and the 1973 International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid define apartheid as a crime against humanity consisting of three elements. First, an intent to maintain domination by one racial group over another. Second, a context of systematic oppression by one racial group over another. And thirdly, inhuman acts. And in 1973, the uh, United Nations defined apartheid as inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over another racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. Although 
uh, later revoked under pressure from the United States and Israel, in 1975, the United Nations specifically applied this definition to Israel, describing the ethnic exclusivism intrinsic to Zionism as, quote, a form of racism and racial discrimination. Now, the African word apartheid is translated hafrada in Hebrew. And ironically, although the Israeli government um, denies that it is an, an apartheid regime, it uses the word to describe the separation barrier which weaves its way through the occupied Palestinian territories, a route which is purposely designed to do two things, maximize the amount of land to be annexed while minimizing the number of Palestinians still living on it. Visualizing Palestine have produced some really helpful uh, graphics to describe how uh, Israel fulfills those three criteria set by uh, the International Criminal Court and the United Nations. We have an intent to dominate one racial group over another. We have uh, a systematic oppression of one racial group over another. And we have inhuman acts. The Hafrada wall based on segregation by ethnicity epitomizes the two policies at the heart of the Israeli version of apartheid, the subjugation of Palestinians and the sequestration of Palestinian land. This policy is achieved in numerous ways described by Jeff Halper, the Israeli anthropologist as a matrix of control, matrix of control. And this year there were two major reports, first of all by the Human Rights Watch and then by Betzalem, the Israeli Human Rights Organization, both corroborating and confirming that Israel is an apartheid state. That's the context. What I want us to do now is look at the biblical justification of apartheid. The biblical case for apartheid has four essential tenets. Essentially, segregationists and those who favored apartheid argue that God has willed and created different races or nations, that he has separated them in their own lands, that he has forbidden mixed marriages, and that he has ordained governments to be obeyed unconditionally. Let's look at some of the Bible passages which are used by segregation or were used by segregationists and those who favor apartheid. The first deals with the origin of racial boundaries and they go back to Genesis chapter 9. After the flood it says the, no the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Now, the problem with using this passage is that it assumes that Shem, Ham and Japheth were the progenitors of three distinct racial groups, even though they had the same father. And logically, that means that any subsequent migrations by their descendants would be without sanction. This is ironic since that would presumably deny any justification for Europeans colonizing North America or South Africa. A second passage which is used is the story of Babel and the segregation of nations. Genesis 11 says, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make the name for ourselves Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So the Lord scattered them from there over, there over all the earth. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. The Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, three assumptions are made here. First, that God caused the confusion of languages because of their attempt at racial integration. Second, that linguistic and racial differences are coextensive. And third, that the divisions of people after the fall were along racial lines. Now, none of those assumptions can be substantiated from Genesis 11. 
First, the text indicates that the confusion of languages was a response to their ambition of building a tower to heaven. Second experience shows that racial and linguistic differences are unrelated. Europeans, for example, while we share similar DNA, are divided by multiple languages. Whereas cities like London, uh, which are made up of multiple ethnic groups, share a common language. And the third false assumption is uh, that um, the fact is that uh, those who were scattered after Babel were all the descendants of Ham. A third uh, set of passages used by uh, segregationists, they believe, condemns mixed marriages, and they turn to Deuteronomy 7 and Ezra chapters 9 and 10. Do not intermarry with them, do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Now, again, in both these passages, segregationists ignore the stated reason for the ban on intermarriage. It wasn't to preserve racial purity. It was to preserve spiritual purity. The ban was related to the fear of paganism and cultic worship entering the people of God. So Ezra's demands were rooted in the need for religious purity, not racial purity. Neither passage justifies a ban on the grounds of color or ethnicity. Indeed, as you read the Bible, you find numerous examples of mixed marriages. It was Abraham, it was Joseph, Moses, David and Solomon. But one of the favorite passages used by segregationists is Acts 17, 26. Quote, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he has marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Now, the obvious problem with using the passage to justify segregation is that it's not referred to. And again, it's ironic that those using this verse to justify the preservation of their ethnic purity were white European colonialists who imposed their borders on indigenous ethnic groups that were there before them. Again, the emphasis of this verse is actually upon the unity of humankind from one man, and it denies any sense of racial superiority. It emphasizes the temporary nature of their existence and their extent. Notice their appointed times. It refers to their rise, and therefore, and segregationists ignore the context. What was God's purpose in arranging the time and place of nations? Well, Paul tells us in the next verse, verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So Acts 17 emphasizes our unity, not our diversity and emphasizes the transitory nature of nations rather than their permanence or independence. His purpose in their creation was that people might seek, find, and know him. But probably the most notorious uh, use of scripture is related <coughs> to the passage in Romans chapter 13. Uh, quote, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Now, the abuse of Romans 13 by segregationists is not hard to expose. The passage <coughs> is explicit in defining the God-given role of governments, which is to protect citizens who do good and punish those who do evil. When a government ceases to do so or reverses those priorities, then it may be inferred that it has ceased to fulfill 
its God-given purpose. And citizens have a moral responsibility to obey God and disobey the government. <clears throat> Jesus was very clear when he said, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Mark 12, verse 17. So let's summarize the passages used to justify segregation and apartheid. The origin of racial boundaries from Genesis 9, justification of black slavery, Genesis 9, uh, Babel, the segregation of nations, Genesis 11, the condemnation of mixed marriages, Ezra 9, national boundaries fixed, Acts 17, and submission to governments, Romans 13. <clears throat> if you're observant, you'll notice we didn't look at the justification of black slavery, but I've left that one out uh, uh, for today. <clears throat> I think I uh, hope I've convinced you that even a cursory examination of the verses used to justify segregation, racial purity, or political boundaries, uh, all of which <clears throat> were at the core of apartheid theology, actually do nothing of the kind. Indeed, in context, they prove the very opposite. So what is the biblical refutation of apartheid? Refuting the theological basis for apartheid and, by the way, Christian Zionism, which is a Christian justification of apartheid, is not very difficult. Indeed, you don't need a long list of scripture passages to counter those used to defend apartheid. It's not like a game of table tennis, you know, your verse against my verse, ping pong, ping pong. It's not like that at all. Just one verse is sufficient. Let me illustrate. Imagine a theology of apartheid is like a can of clear lemonade or Sprite. It represents the demands for racial purity, um, a ban on mixed marriages and fixed national boundaries based on ethnicity. And, um, <clears throat> but what happens when you add Coke to Sprite. What happens? What happens if you add just a tiny little bit of Coca-Cola to Sprite? What happens? It changes color. And once you've added Coke to Sprite, you can't go back to Sprite. The two have become one. In the same way, just one mixed marriage in scripture is enough to confound any notion that God intended racial purity. And so in like manner, just one Bible verse that challenges apartheid adulterates and annuls their interpretation of scripture. I'm going to give you a few examples that I hope will reinforce what I'm saying. The first is we find in scripture an ethnic diversity of God's people. In the Old Testament, there are numerous examples of Gentiles who came to believe in the one true God were, and were accepted into the people of God. Joshua chapter 6 tells us the story of Rahab. Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. She was welcomed into the people of God, not just Rahab, but her whole family. And the same with Ruth, the story of Ruth. Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you and to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And you know what? Both Rahab and Ruth appear in the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew 1, verse 6 and 7. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obad, whose mother was Ruth. Obad, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. The ethnic diversity of God's people. Secondly, an inclusive Israel. The ambiguous nature of Israel's contemporary claims to be a democracy as well as a Jewish state were dispelled with the passing of the 
controversial nation state law in 2018, which defined Israel as the state exclusively for the Jewish people. It may come as a surprise that the Old Testament knows nothing of this contemporary form of segregation or ethnic exclusivity. Israel as a nation was never narrowly restricted to those who were the physical descendants of the 12 tribes of Jacob, the 12 sons. Israel as a nation always incorporated people of other races, and this extended not just to their identity, their right of residence, but also to their inheritance of land and their right to worship God in the temple. Let me give you a few examples. This is taken from Psalm 87 verses four and six. I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me. Philistia too and Tyre along with Cush and will say, this one was born in Zion. The Lord will write in the register of the peoples, this one was born in Zion. You see, David looked forward to the day when other races, the Egyptians, that's Rahab, the Persians, that's uh, 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 the Iraqi, sorry, Babylon, the Palestinians, that's Philistia, Lebanese, that's Tyre, and Africans, that's Cush, would share the same identity and privileges as the Israelites. Note that phrase, this one was born in Zion. What do you normally get when you are born somewhere? You get citizenship, you get rights. Now, why would the Lord God have to repeat himself three times in three verses? This one was born in Zion. Perhaps because the Lord's people didn't want to share Zion. And observe the only criteria for citizenship God lays down is what? Faith. Those who acknowledge me. God welcomes those who acknowledge him. And in the beautiful story of Esther, when God has delivered his people from their enemies, what happens? What happens next? Esther 8 verse 17. In every province and in every city, there was joy and gladness among the Jews. That's the the origin of the Feast of Purim. It was feasting and celebrating. But notice what happened next. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Many people of other nationalities. Other nationalities, that's in the plural, many means many. An inclusive Israel. An inclusive Israel inheritance also, as if to emphasize that citizenship means more than a new passport, God instructs the Israelites to share the land. This is from Ezekiel 47, when they returned to the land from exile, God says, you are to allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who settled among you and who have children. You are to consider them as native born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe the alien settles there, you are to give him his inheritance, declares the sovereign Lord. Now notice, the Lord has to say the same thing three times in two verses. Give him his inheritance. And why does God have to say, share your inheritance three times in two verses? Presumably, because the returning exiles didn't want to share their inheritance. God makes it crystal clear through his prophet that the Gentiles who acknowledge him have the same rights as native born Israelites. An inclusive Israel, an inclusive land, and then thirdly, an inclusive temple, an inclusive temple. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord God is quite explicit, insisting Gentiles may enter his temple. Isaiah 56, verse 3, let no foreigner who's bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of this Lord, to be his servants. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them the joy of my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all 
nations. Now think about it. If the Lord insists that foreigners should not say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people, why would foreigners say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people? Simple. Because the Lord's people must have been doing the excluding. Presumably on the same supremacist grounds advocated by segregationist Zionists today. The people of God in scripture were always defined on the basis of faith, not race. Faith, not race. We must resist any attempt to make exclusive what God has made inclusive. No wonder Jesus quotes this passage when he throws out the money changers and the traders from the temple. He wasn't cleansing the temple he was closing the temple because Jesus had become our temple but the New Testament makes this refutation of apartheid even more explicit you see in the New Testament segregation is actually rebuked the apostle Paul develops this theme in his letter to the Galatians with a painful if personal example. Galatians chapter 2. When Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, quote, how is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. This is a very significant uh, encounter. A very significant encounter. Peter is rebuked because he is practicing segregation that was implicit within Jewish customs. And he was denying their unity in the gospel, Jews and Gentiles, brothers and sisters. He was undermining the gospel by choosing not to eat with the Gentiles, but only to eat with the legalists. In the next chapter, we see that the reason for this the ethnic barriers have been removed by the gospel. Chapter three, Galatians, Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, <clears throat> then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, obviously they were still uh, Jews or Gentiles. They were slaves or free. They were male or female. But what he's saying is that more important than your ethnic Diversity is your spiritual unity in Jesus Christ. And notice as well, Paul explicitly denies the claim that the seed of Abraham were the Jewish people by ethnicity or genealogy. There are no grounds for supremacism among Christians. That's why John Stott called Christian Zionism biblical anathema, because it's creating a wall of partition. There are no grounds for supremacism. Abraham's inheritance is for all who trust in Jesus, irrespective of ethnicity. Ethnic divisions are transformed by the gospel because, because God's ultimate purpose is to create one new humanity. One new humanity. And we see this in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We're given this glorious insight into how Jewish and Gentile believers in Jesus Christ have been brought into a new citizenship that transforms former ethnic barriers and religious divisions. Ephesians 2.11, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the church, through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Now we're not talking about where we sit in church, 
we're talking about how we live out our faith in the world. You see, the New Testament does not teach that the Gentiles have superseded the Jews. But neither does it teach that the Jewish people retain a position of superiority over the Gentiles or indeed over the church. There is a continuity between the believers of the old covenant who look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ and believers under the new covenant who look forward to his return. See, God doesn't have two chosen peoples. The church hasn't replaced Israel. The church is Israel. There is a continuity. God's Old Testament saints, God's New Testament saints. When Christ died on the cross, he broke down the wall of separation. So the Bible does not warrant racial exclusivity, giving any race preferential or elevated status within God's kingdom or on earth. God's intention was always been to create for himself one new people drawn from every race and nation under one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you have seen that supremacy and ethnic segregation is repudiated by the Hebrew scriptures and by the New Testament insistence on our equality as sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ as a united but diverse family of God. We've seen the ethnic diversity of God's people from the New Testament uh, and, and the old. We've seen the inclusive Israel and inclusive inheritance an inclusive temple. The segregation in the church rebuked, ethnic barriers removed because we have one new humanity. Now, if you can only remember one of the passages we've looked at, remember the illustration of Sprite and Coke and what happens when you add Coke to Sprite. Conclusions. The use of the Bible to normalize segregation was never undertaken in isolation. It was always attempted retrospectively by European colonialists to justify the subjugation of dependent people and the sequestration of foreign lands. In this regard, apartheid was and remains, whether former South Africa or contemporary Israel, it's not about maintaining racial purity, as it is about maintaining racial supremacy. And it's sobering, as we saw earlier, to realize that the segregationist policies designed to preserve European racial purity in the USA inspired fascism in Germany and apartheid in South Africa. Largely with the complicity of the institutional churches, supremacism has led to the blasphemous justification of slavery, to segregation, fascism, apartheid, and genocide. If we really care about justice, peace, and reconciliation, it is time to challenge apartheid in Israel-Palestine as well, peacefully and non-violently. 20 years ago, 20 years ago, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, the end of apartheid stands as one of the crowning accomplishments of the last century, but we would not have succeeded without the help of international pressure. If apartheid ended, so can the occupation. But the moral force and international pressure will have to be just as determined. The current divestment effort is the first, though certainly not the only necessary move in that direction. We began with a dream of Martin Luther King. What is your dream, your vision of the future? What kind of world do you want for your children and your grandchildren? If you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, how do you envision that peace? And how do you anticipate it's going to come about? In the book of Revelation, there is a glorious heavenly vision of a restored humanity ethnically, linguistically, and culturally diverse, yet standing together, not segregated, one in heart, soul, and mind. 
Revelation 7. After this I looked, says John, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Notice that little word from in verse nine, from every nation, from every tribe, from every people, from every language. They were not segregated. They were not separated. They were standing together. What did they have in common? They were all wearing the same white clothes, all singing the same song, all together, united in joyful adoration. If that is what heaven will be like, surely the people of God should be aligning itself with where we are headed, offering to outsiders a foretaste of heaven. You see, only a biblical vision of God and his purposes for our world, revealed fully and finally in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, can deliver us from the illusion of racial purity and the idolatry of racist supremacism. Now, if you want to unpack this in more detail, if you go to my website, stephensizer.com, uh, and look under this uh, subject, you'll find uh, I've written a much longer paper, The Biblical Response to Israeli Apartheid, on which this uh, short presentation was based. You'll find a series of Bible study questions, which you can use on your own or for group discussion. And you'll find um, uh, resources such as my two books, uh, Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon, that was based on my PhD, and Zion's Christian Soldiers, which uh, unpacks in more detail how to understand the Bible and the relationship between Israel and the church, both published uh, by Whip and Stock. Uh, you can access them from, uh, from any uh, Christian bookstore or online from Amazon or um, but uh, you'll find a lot of the content is available uh, from my website. And there's a, a four page outline, uh, a summary of Zion's Christian soldiers available called What is the Relationship Between Israel and the Church? And we unpack some of the passages which we looked at in this presentation. At the Sabio Karas conference um, earlier this year, we passed uh, a statement which was endorsed by the trustees of Sabil Kairos. It has the support of Sabil Jerusalem and Kairos Palestine. And uh, my understanding is it's the first statement by a Christian organization repudiating Israeli apartheid. This is what we said. Having considered a Christian response to Israeli apartheid, we affirm that all people are created equally in the image of God. We commend the Bethlehem and Human Rights Watch documents designated Israel as an apartheid state. We repudiate all forms of racism and discrimination, and we recommit ourselves to working for justice, peace and reconciliation in Israel, Palestine. Thank you and God bless you.